This session, as I mentioned, dedicated to the role of Chambers of Commerce, have been crafted and uh, introduced within the program in order to address one of the core, or I, I will say the core element of the EFCFT, or the core element of trade, or the core element of economy, or the core element of making sure that we accomplish the value addition that we need. Namely, this is the private sector. And I'm very glad today and very here to, to have the representative of those um, private sector people through the chambers of commerce or through whatever the corporate or professional association that uh, they, are, they are in. If really we want Mr. Bosco, yes, Please welcome, I will, I'll introduce you later. Um, if really we have to not only make our AFCFTA succeed, we have to give way, we have to empower the very actor uh, and also the very beneficiary of the AFCFTA, which is the private sector. Uh, and uh, today we'll be hearing from them on how we do those elements in a way that really will be conducive to um, uh, making this, this thing happen. In order to address those issues, uh, the terms of reference of this uh, session uh, speak about uh, four elements. But as you know, in terms of uh, working, at least from the consultancy side, whenever you have terms of reference, you have uh, inception notes, whereby you add the changes, you make changes on this, and I will speak about it later. The first question to be addressed uh, is to respond to the question on how and what sharing relevant information, training, and advocacy are to be done in order to achieve a smooth, uh, better uh, implementation of the uh, FCFTA, uh, in particular for the um, private sector. The uh, second issue to be addressed relate to the opportunities, the finding the identification of opportunities for integration of key value chain and establishment of country competitive advantage under the FCFTA. Uh, this morning, uh, the first uh, plenary session was uh, dedicated to the financing of uh, regional and continental value chain, and um, uh, it was very interesting. And I. The actors here will really go deeper and uh, follow up on, on this. The third question to be addressed uh, is to get the linking optimal production and market access efficiencies, supply and demand, still under the context of the AFCFTA. And let me finally get the uh, final question, uh, before final, how to understand what has to be done, what has to be drafted in a way to understand the structure and conduct and performance, performance of intra-Africa trade under the FCFTA. Because if we, we have to get FCFTA succeed, not only it has to deepen, to amplify, and to strengthen intra-African trade, but to do so with African originated products. And to make those African origin of the product, we have not only to have the rules of origin right, but also we have very importantly to have the very private sector who will be producing uh, those goods and, and um, of, um, getting uh, those uh, services right uh, uh, in partnership with the uh, foreign, foreign investors and foreign uh, private sector. Lastly, uh, an issue that we added uh, is the issue of financing of trade. Especially, uh, the private sector in our countries is uh, mainly made by SMEs and even uh, some smaller SMEs, uh, and we need to address those, particularly in terms of their composition as covering youth and women. How to make sure that they get the uh, financing, because FCFTA is about developing markets, expanding markets, about abolishing uh, trade rules 
uh, barriers or non-barriers, but at the end of the day, uh, it's about selling and reciprocally uh, buying. So you buy and you sell goods, uh, you uh, furnish services, and you have to make sure that those really are the ones that are generated from, from Africa. So the issue of funding is key also, not only to FCFTA, not only um, uh, to uh, trade, but to the private sector uh, as a whole, because whenever they want to expand their market, they need those kind of finance. They will get them the investment, they will get them the uh, uh, human resources, they will get them uh, the um, technology that, is, that are needed in order to produce. So um, while uh, my people are being quiet in order to come, okay, so do and then come. I will just give the name. First of all, you have Dr. Amani Asfour, President of the African Business Council. Yo, you do and then you come. Do your wiring and then come. So welcome, Dr. Amani. Then you have Dr. Gevara Yao, Executive Director of the U.S. Africa Business Center, which is part of the U.S. American Chamber of Commerce, International Affair. So welcome, Dr. Yao, uh, and have a seat. Yes. Dr. Amani is fine. Okay, have a seat. And then you have Tumi Dwamini, Special Advisor uh, on Corporate Governance and Global Partnership to the Executive uh, Director of the African Peer Review Mechanism, APRM. Please. While my people are being wired, uh, I would like just maybe uh, to give two additional notes. First one, we have a colleague from ITC, International Trade uh, Center in Geneva, uh, part of the WTO, uh, which, who is here, uh, Mrs. Uh, Lily Sommer. Uh, she's attending the, uh, the forum, but especially on this session, uh, she would like to showcase with us uh, the newly publication that they have <coughs> is, excuse me, Unpacking the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area, a glossary, which is a, a glossary, a kind of manual that they have prepared, uh, and uh, I will give her uh, some time at the end of the session to explain and um, also to deliver copies. Uh, I guess she came with some uh, hard copies, and then she will also be handing over those copies uh, for the, you guys that will be, and thank you, and really, for this work, we really commend the uh, very capacity building work and technical action that you are doing. So, uh, now I'm introducing Mr. Aminu Akadiri, Executive Director of the Africa Business Council. Mr. Aminu, please have a seat. I would also like, uh, while uh, we have been prepared and getting white, our, our people, to make a special tribute. And uh, doing so, I'm sure I'll be doing it all of your, of your behalf to pay tribute to SG, His Excellency Wamkele Mene, really for the hard work, for the success, and for the long standing um, commitment and engagement in this process throughout. Um, really, uh, through him, Africa is redrafting the rules in its favor. Africa is not chasing, is not excluding foreign partners to the contrary. But Africa is being writing through His Excellency Wamkele Mene the very template, the new template, the new software that really would allow Africa to benefit from trade uh, in, uh, in the context of the uh, um, FCFTA. So we have now Mr. Hopwell Musundire, sorry if I is um, the uh, business development manager of the Comesa Business Council. Actually, he's uh, um, 
uh, in this panel in lieu of uh, Mr. Teddy, who is the uh, CEO of Comesa, who had an urgent matters to take care of, and uh, Mr. Hopewell is here to uh, Mr. Kabor, have you been wired yet? <laughs> Part of the process. Okay. So we have Mr. Kabor Gena, Executive Director of the Pan African Chamber of Commerce. So Mr. Kabor, welcome. And then the last one, I haven't seen him. Yeah, Mr. Bosco, I've seen. Yeah, but uh, we need another chair. Mr. Bosco, can we have another have chair? Well, no, there is a chair. Is it chair? No, we have two. Can, no. you, can you can you have? Can I have your mic? No, 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 I think it's very important that Bosco be here. You have your card? Yeah, card. You have a card? <laughs> yeah? Card, card, business card. I want to get your right. Yeah, okay, your right. okay, okay. Mm. The business okay. card is your Bosco. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you uh, in the previous session, but. Uh, I don't want to get uh, your name wrong. So we did. Okay. okay. Thank you. So you are you are you are Mr. Dyer, right? Yeah. Uh, organizer, please. May I have uh, uh, another chair for one of the panelists? Maybe we'll 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 put we'll we'll put it down and then. Okay, thank you for your understanding. So um, you have so Yusuf Daya is the AU AFCFTA Relation and Trade Policy uh, Manager at the Africa Bank. I have card that will uh, come back. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, um, Mr. John Bosco Kalisa, Executive Director. Um, of the EABC, standing for East African, East African Business, Council. Business Council. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So uh, here is, uh, are your panelists. And um, as I mentioned, they, will, uh, they have been very um, brief uh, on the question to ask. Uh, any one of them will be tackling uh, one or two questions that uh, he or she deems uh, more relevant to him or to her or to his or her organization. And then uh, we'll be having discussion uh, with the floor. And at the end, uh, we'll be making some concluding uh, remarks. So I will uh, start off by uh, giving the uh, floor to uh, Dr. Ameni, uh, who is the, um, uh, the president of the African Business Council. Please, doctor. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. So, uh, my dear uh, brothers and sisters here, I think this is a powerhouse. This is the private sector of Africa. And without private sector, there is no ACFTA. There is no intra-Africa trade. There is no industrialization. So let us first put the rules here that this is a powerhouse, this present in front of you, is the real player for the implementation of ACFTA and actually for boosting our intra-Africa trade. So having said that, Africa Business Council is established in line with the Heads of State Decision Summit for boosting our intra-Africa trade and fast-tracking the implementation of ACFTA. So we are actually established within the architecture of ACFTA. And our founding vision is competitive, borderless, innovative Africa for trade, investment, and industrialization. Because if we say trade, we cannot trade without industrialization. So our membership is huge and includes all of us present here in this panel because the Africa Business Council, as mandated by, by the House of State, is the organized private sector of the continent, but inclusive membership of the business councils Union of Industries, Manufacturers Associations, 
SMEs, corporates. So we are happy here to have among us Comesa Business Council, which is a member of the board. And actually, the president of Comesa Business Council is my vice president. We have here Federation of West Africa Chamber of Commerce, which is also the vice chair for, Comesa, for, uh, for Africa Business Council. We have the East Africa Chamber. I mean, my brother Bosco, he's from East Africa Business Council, which is already represented. We have the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce. My brother Kobur is here, who is also on the board. So you see, this is all the constituencies of the Rex and the continental private sector that is mandated for the implementation of ACFJ. So I think we are only such a small uh, uh, number, but we are the biggest constituencies on the continent. So my brother, you asked three questions which are very potent for all of us. First one was really about building capacity and awareness. So according to the strategy of the Africa Business Council, we have a triad of empowerment with three pillars, three Ps. The first pillar is private sector strengthening, including SMEs, women and youth, because we know the backbone of our economy is the SMEs, the women and youth. And having said that, so how we build the capacity, as you rightly said, my dear professor, it's about awareness, raising information. So who will implement ACFJ? Mm -hmm. It's the private sector. It's the SMEs, it's the women entrepreneurs, it's the youth entrepreneurs. So we need to build their capacity with awareness, with information, with actually mentoring, with giving them the tools for their power to implement. The second pillar is policy, advocacy. Because you mentioned poli advocacy. We are advocating actually through the, all the constituencies present here. So if we're talking about 21 countries of com common markets for Eastern South and Africa, my brother Hope is there to represent, I am also a board member of Commissar Business Council, which is my advice. We cascade our work to go through Commissar Business Council, we go through Federation of Chamber of Commerce, through my brother from East Africa Business Council. So this is one policy we are really working on is to have at least 40% of all government procurement goes to African private sector. Because if we don't do that, we'll find China come and take all the contractors. We'll find all the, our, our market dumped by containers coming from all over the world. Another policy is harmonization among our, our products. Because if we want to register a, co a product in one country, we cannot go and register it across the whole uh, uh, of, of countries across the continent. We need to have standardization, harmonization for policies. Financial inclusion, and my brother, my brother Dea is here because this is really about how to access credit and finance. The third pillar, as you mentioned, my brother, is how to have a Made in Africa product, which is, we call it the 3P, the product development. Branding, designing, packaging, standardization, quality, competitive, because if you want to buy Africa, it has to be a good product. We are not going to buy Africa because it's a bad product, but because it's standardized and value added. And doing this, it's very important to collaborate all of us together. It's the real integration. Even with us of Africa and our peers from the whole world. So US Chamber is there. How can we work together as Africa for an international market, but with promoting our Made in Africa products? So it is very, very, very important that when we talk about product development, we need to set up technology parks. We need to set up business development centers. We need to set up uh, business incubators. We need to, set to, to align our industries with scientific research and technology because this is how R&D help us, the technology, how we have a Made in Africa product which is competitive and standardized. So the whole elements and the multifactorial things cannot happen if it's not a one man show. It's a holistic approach of all of us as all the RACs and Continental Business Councils, Chambers of Commerce, Private Sector Federations, Union of Industries, Manufacturer Association, Women Entrepreneurs, Youth Entrepreneurs. The main tool to do that is to have our business linkage together, is to have integration among ourselves, 
is to have business linkages, is to have a mapping exercise of what's existing on the continent. So if we have minerals on the continent, why are they exported as raw? We need to add value in it. If we have agriculture, why don't we have agribusiness? If we have any product on the continent, we need to have value addition. So this is how it's, we all of us are here today to present how can the private sector play its role in the real implementation of ACFGA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, round of applause for uh, Dr. Amani, please. <coughs> Thank you for this very um, comprehensive and uh, opportune um, opening remarks. Uh, I will divide the session I mean, into four parts. The first will go to the private sector themselves. Uh, so next will be uh, Mr. Bosco and then uh, Mr. Hopwell. And then we'll be uh, doing the policy part or the governance part. And we'll be Oh, and we'll be uh, giving the floor uh, to uh, Youssef and also to, uh, to me. And then uh, we'll be having um, John's part uh, before coming to uh, IPC. So, um, uh, Mr. Bosco, the uh, Executive Director of the East African Business Council, you have the floor. Next, uh, uh, yes, um, good afternoon. Um, uh, as I have been introduced, I'm John Bosco Carissa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Business Council. Allow me again to congratulate my fellow panelists, uh, especially our President of African Business Council and other CEOs present here. Also, I commend and appreciate the efforts by the CFTA Secretariat uh, including the partners like uh, Frexim Bank, ITC, that have uh, enabled the acceleration of this <coughs> noble agreement. It is really, uh, I always say it is a new dawn for Africa. It is a new dawn for the business in Africa to do business within Africa. There has been, um, the framework has been agreed and now, what, uh, what is required is implementation. When you look at the numbers, what we call state parties, so far, 47 countries have ratified the treaty establishing the CFTA. That's commendable. That's the political will that has been ably demonstrated. So what is required now is the business, the business community to drive the CFTA. And I always say that government does not do trade. The role of government is to create a neighboring environment for trade to thrive, for investment, to generate prosperity, to generate jobs that we want. <coughs> I want to come and highlight why this session is very important. It's a very cardinal session. There are other sessions because the treaty the framework establishing the CFTA is very clear. The framework is anchored, is anchored under RECs. RECs are regional economic communities. They are regional communities. There are eight regional communities that are recognized by African Union. Comesa, SADAC, ECAS, ECOWAS, and other, there are eight. So under those eight frameworks, we always have business councils. And it's very important that these business councils drive the business in their respective rates, in their respective regional economic communities. And I think that's why we are here. The politicians have done their work. Now we are talking about acceleration of the CFTA. So now it is very paramount and important to bring this perspective to light is that we need to drive this agreement. The private sector needs to regain its seat by driving this regional integration agenda, this continent agenda, the CFTA. So that's why we are here. And our role, what we need to do as uh, the business council, again, coming to the moderator, one, and I will share example from ESC uh, region or from my organization which I had, 
One, we need to raise awareness among our, the business community about the, the protocol as well as its annexes. Its annexes, because the first phase highlighted trade in goods and trade in services. The framework has been created, but there are still a number of areas that we need to understand, especially the instrument that will enable us to trade, take advantage of the wider market. So those instruments, one is that we need to get the rules of origin right. Because the rules of origin, this is a passport for the product. You cannot export a product from uh, Kenya to Ghana without conforming to the rules of origin. That's number one. Number two, we need the standards, harmonized the standards and the mutual recognition. That's very paramount. Number three, we need the logistics, transport and logistics, as in Nebora for the movement of goods and services. Then another important aspect is trade information is very critical. It's very critical. We need to inform our business community what to trade in, where to trade in. So we need to gather all the, what are the documentation that are required to trade for the trade to happen? Are the customs arrangement aligned or harmonized? That's very important. Now another aspect that is very critical that has not been mentioned anywhere, even when I've been here for two, three days, is what we call factor market integration. Now when we talk about factor market integration, we are talking about openness, visa openness. And the visa has been, goods don't move alone, they move with the people. We need to ensure that business visas are harmonized, are simplified, they are removed, so that people can move, can support the movement of goods. Finally, on what we have done at the EAC, at the EAC as a business community, we've first of all, two important aspects moderator. One is that so far, we've trained our members, around 300 uh, business operators in ESC, uh, in the various areas related to protocol. And I'm happy to note here that among eight countries that were selected under guided trade initiative, three came from East Africa. That is Kenya, Rwanda, United Republic of Tanzania, and even Uganda now. So what we did as a, as a business council is to raise awareness about this instrument. That, we do, that would enable trade to happen. That, that, so the awareness raising is a continuous uh, process and we are doing it, we are sensitizing our members in terms of understanding the intricacies about this protocol. Finally, what we've done, and which I want to commend our partners present here, is that we have engaged our partners. And uh, allow me to appreciate and commend Africzim Bank. They have given us a resource, they have given EABC resources to support women and youth to understand this protocol. Congratulations, my brother, and we've been talking to you, I've been talking to you, you said no, we are ready to support you. ITC, International Trade Center, we have, they have provided a support in terms of what you call export ready guide, how to export under CFTA. Eh? We are working with the GIZ in terms of supporting our members to understand the process, the documentation that are required. Uh, that are required. So those are, uh, moderator, those are, I think, I wanted to shed more light what we can do uh, so that even other business councils can, can learn from what so far we have done. So with that, it means that East Africa, we are the only legs or business community who have already started trading under CFT. We are trading. Coffee comes from Rwanda to Ghana, tea from Kenya to Ghana, and the batteries. Tanzania, spices from Tanzania to Ghana. So it is happening, and we can share with you more experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before uh, Opwell take the floor, I mean, this is this speak to the very running, to the very optimization of the AFCFT. Mm. And coming from a private sector perspective, I mean, this is something that uh, really is uh, commendable. I just would like to cite maybe three aspects. The first one is from the uh, partner organization. I mean, uh, I was getting some literature about Africanism Bank, but I would call them like the twin brother of FCFTA, because everything that uh, FCFTA is doing, mm. he is doing it because and 
uh, in support from you, and uh, we, we have to commend it. The second one is ITC in terms of trade and market intelligence, mm. trade and market information. Mm. I mean, this very glossary, uh, newly published, really speaks to that. And uh, I was browsing uh, some copy of it, and uh, really that will also add uh, help. And also from the secretary, we have the manual or rules of origin. Mm. Because as a teacher, I tell my student, a lot of them are skeptical. Mm. They say, oh, did you do the right thing? Uh, how will it go? I say, OK. The AFCFTA is the boosting of intra-African trade, but of goods generating from Africa. And goods generating from Africa have to have, like yourself, an ID card. And that ID card is rule of origin. So this is very important. And as you heard yesterday, the Secretary General, His Excellency Yom Kele Mene, saying that at this stage, at the moment, we have 88% of the rules on rule origin uh, been agreed. So that means that really we are very advanced on this. So thank you very much uh, for really being factual and being on the ground on, on, on this issue. That's what really we would like to have from this session. Uh, next, uh, we have um, uh, Commissar, uh, Mr. Hopwell, uh, sitting uh, for uh, Teddy, the uh, CEO of uh, Commissar. Have the floor, please. Um, Five minutes, please. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for that. Uh, thank you, Director Doctors, for, for for preempting and also uh, noting the, the need for uh, business support institutions in the region to work together towards a, a common goal. That will assist in uh, consolidating resources and also um, having a systematic approach into how uh, the products are supposed to move uh, from one corner to another. I think uh, during the COVID-19, it uh, exposed uh, us as a region how um, we are not uh, our rules and regulations and uh, uh, how they are not speaking to each other where we are trying to move products from a country which is part of the SADC region to m pass through a country which is a member of COMESA and probably moving uh, past these countries. You realize that when the, the products reach a certain border, uh, they are not able to pass through because the regulations or policies are not speaking to each other. So the more we come together as uh, business support institutions, the more we achieve more. I'm happy that uh, also uh, SADC Business Council is, is, is available, is, uh, is around. I think during the COVID-19, we came together to, 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 to write regulations which will guide movement of our products and services from one country of uh, SADC to a commercial uh, uh, region. So it also facilitated movement of raw materials, products, and services to our countries. So coming to, uh, to, uh, to the discussion on the table, I think one of the things that we must look into the, to address or to assist our small to medium enter uh, enterprises, women and business, they might, not de they might have heard about uh, the Africa continental free trade area. But it's another thing to understand what is on the table. What do I need to do as a woman in business? What do I need to do as a small to medium enterprises to tap into the uh, opportunities which do exist? So as a commercial business council, we have teamed up with um, African Union, uh, the ITC, to offer uh, capacity building on uh, uh, issues to do with tariffs, uh, issues to do with opportunities which are available. And uh, in the past year, we have trained about uh, seven countries in the Comesa region. And also this year, we are going to train about uh, more five countries within the Comesa region. So the training uh, is trying to unpack issues to do with tariffs, issues to do with uh, uh, opportunities. How do I export my products? What do I need to do? How do I prepare packaging? for me to be able to export my product. What do I expect, what, what is my expectation as a woman in business when I get to the border? So that uh, uh, they, are, they have knowledge on how to move their products. So we are offering that uh, training, we are partnering with uh, ITC and other relevant institutions so that we, we, uh, we upgrade the knowledge of our small to medium enterprises. I think uh, uh, the other thing that we do as Commercial Business Council is to offer a platform where 
we bring the public sector and the private sector to have a discussion on how to create a conducive environment uh, uh, within the region uh, of Comesa, which will also translate to other African countries. Uh, in the past year, we have been able to bring the president, for example, with the, pri with the private sector, so that the, the private sector are able to, to highlight the challenges that they face each and every day. Uh, the platform that we set uh, will be not written speeches where the pre president comes to read a speech. Uh, we are going to have another one in, on the 7th of June uh, uh, this year where we will bring uh, presidents within, about seven presidents within the Comesa region where they will meet uh, the, the, the private sector. And the private sector will have an opportunity to speak to the presidents, uh, not within a, a, a script which is written. So that gives uh, an opportunity to create a, a conducive environment where they are able to move uh, products, services uh, across the region. And I'm happy my brother here have highlighted issues to do with standards, issues to do with um, the movement of uh, people. It also needs us as BSOs uh, in front to at, at some point come together because uh, the uh, product does not uh, actually circulate within Comesa. If we have the right standards in Comesa, if we've got the right of, uh, if we harmonize our standards in Comesa, but if they are not speaking to the same standards in, uh, in EAC, in SADC, uh, we we'll still have a challenge where we need to source raw materials or export a certain product uh, to another region. So at one point, we'll need to speak to, to each other consolidate resources, if you are focusing on, uh, focusing on standards within Comesa, I think we need to speak to EAC and also check what are the developments, ECOWAS, what are the developments, mm -hmm. so that we speak with one voice and also save mm -hmm. resources. Because we realize that uh, Comesa is doing a study, EAC is doing a study, and then after concluding, we realize that the, all the studies are not speaking to each other. Then we come again to invest in uh, mm -hmm. other resources to consolidate or harmonize uh, this. I think uh, that's, that's what I have for. Thank you very much. Applause, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me um, uh, extend uh, to um, the CEO, Mr. Teddy, uh, my uh, greetings. Uh, we were together in Geneva. He was delegate from uh, Mauritius, and I was delegate from Senegal to the WTO. Uh, so a friend and also a long practitioner in terms of the uh, trade issues, so uh, please extend to him our greetings. Uh, number two, I mean, uh, four quick elements that also speak to the very uh, conduciveness of uh, uh, the sector, uh, the private sector in these. Number one, as John Bosco was mentioning, uh, you will see a lot of trade happening, but not being translated into the statistics. Uh, this is something also, uh, because uh, the, in the literature, say that uh, the entertained African is, is low. The highest is your region, 18%, uh, yes. but we don't count those informal. And number two, as uh, Hopper was uh, talking about, those informal from 80% are from youth and women, cross border trade. And uh, I think that also that's something that we need to address. And the good news is that now we are negotiating a protocol on um, gender, on women and youth, yes. that will really kind of address uh, this issue, and hopefully uh, we have not, don't have to get it only for women and youth to negotiate, but also we need those trade people, uh, because most of SMEs are for uh, youth and for women, in order to, to get it right. Uh, the last element is about the, the governance issue, and uh, to me, uh, about this, uh, on really internally first, within the private sector and within the private sector themselves, the umbrella organization. You just mentioned that uh, you don't have those kind of very harmonization. Uh, John Bosco was with me this morning in the session on investment. Yes. He also uh, posed a question to the yes. uh, panelists. And uh, the, one of the issue is the harmonization. It's, it's, it's good to have the rules to pave uh, the field, but how do we harmonize? Make sure that the norm and standard from Comesa are the same uh, with uh, uh, ECOWAS and so on and so on. So 
uh, this is a very critical issue. And luckily also here, we have annexes uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, standard and mm -hmm. norms, on uh, SPS measures, on uh, uh, um, um, uh, TBT, uh, technical barrier to trade, that will really uh, have, have given the, uh, the, the floor, uh, the, 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 the opportunity. And we need to translate those, those into like um, mutual recognition agreement uh, in order really to un once again boof, uh, boost the intertrade. So the last one on this um, private sector issue is Amino Akadiri. Just one, one word about Amino Akadiri. Uh, he is the uh, executive director of the Africa Business Council. He worked extensively uh, in ECOWAS and his country, uh, Benin, uh, in the process of um, having a regional investment court of ECOWAS, which is called now the Community Investment Court, which has been adopted on uh, December 22nd, uh, 2018. He was part and parcel and was very instrumental from his country, Benin, and also from the ECOWAS wise. And he worked so well that ECOWAS recruited him as a member and the staff of ECOWAS. And that's where Dr. Amani saw him and others <laughs> and, uh, you know, elevated him also. He's a very hard, hard working uh, boy. Uh, he, he, he's young, uh, but he's full of wisdom, full of capacity. And uh, hopefully he will do a very good job. Uh, and he's doing it. Uh, beside uh, Dr. Amani for the private sector, not only in uh, West Africa, but also as a whole, uh, continent-wide. So, Aminu, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, my, my professor, because he is my professor. He teaches me well. He took me from Benin Republic to Nigeria and uh, where I am today. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me bring the greeting from those who cannot come here those who didn't have the voice, those that uh, we at Shemekeko are representing, it is the uh, SMEs, a famous sector. We come here to South Africa because we have the capacity to have a visa to access to South Africa. There are those people, when they ask to meet uh, the local government uh, agency, it's difficult to meet. That is uh, those we are working for at Chambers of Commerce. So I'm bringing to you their greeting. So talking about the role of Chambers of Commerce on uh, implementing of CFTA, I will say we should hold Chambers of Commerce for boosting intra-Africa trade. And that role starts at the border and finish at the border. Because if you want to talk about uh, how we can boost intra-Africa trade, you go to the border. The first thing is uh, the first step of economic integration, free trade. How people can move easily, how can we move the good easily? The second one is uh, custom. We custom is still at the border. That's the second step. How can we harmonize custom policy? The next one is harmonizing policy, uh, investment code, agricultural, agricultural policy. It's still at the border. We have that because it's between two countries. And the last one is uh, how we can pay when I buy to other side or this side payment system. So you see the, the secrecy of economic integration start at the border, finish at the border. We have COVID-19 that uh, expedits everything. We move faster. I may say that uh, with uh, my excuse that the COVID-19 also impacted the ASFT uh, implementation. Because ASFT was meant to facilitate trade between one country and another country. But today, we are talking about uh, common markets. We are talking about a payment system. So we move from how uh, the existing protocol, free movement, a uh, free trade to payment system where we are today. So we at Chambers of Commerce, taking West Africa, Chambers of Commerce especially, what we did is that uh, we have the capability to assess head of state. We have observer status to African Union as a private sector from West Africa. We have observer status to ECOWAS head of state. So our mandate is to promote trade investments across the border and access to market. So if I can take a few best practices on how we can take that experience to boost the interplay is the best uh, experience that we have, like a bank that we created to facilitate ease of a business in West Africa, EcoBank as everybody can do. So for us, if you are to achieve the objective of SFTA, we should come together with a joint company. 
like you can call common community enterprises, is when citizens of region or all the Africa, they have the share in the company, that's where we can save our interest. I, I got uh, some study who said that uh, West Africa is ag agro business, Central Africa, East Africa, agro business, South Africa automotive. If we want to achieve this objective of CFTA, is to make sure that uh, each member state has their experience, uh, uh, benefit in uh, this type of company. So what we are suggesting at Kiwasi is that uh, citizens of each, uh, all the member states should come together and create joint company. That will help to ease the business among the, the country. That's what I come so, uh, for, uh, put on the table as the role Chambers of Commerce can play in achieving the objective of ASFT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Aminu. Yeah. Round of applause. And uh, I guess you, two sh uh, you two touched a very important point before uh, getting the floor to Kebu um, on a continent wide. And uh, once again, so at the end, um, Dr. Amani will come as the umbrella organization for uh, uh, the African private sector and lead. Um, one of my conclusions to you guys is to have what I call um, Cape Town Declaration private sector, African private sector, Cape Town Declaration. Mm. All what we heard from these two days or three days, I mean, speak to the core issue of private sector. Mm. And you are here, you need to talk together, you need to liaise, you need to make sure that uh, from here, there is no longer absentia between EAC and uh, the uh, ADC and uh, Comesa on those issues, the mm. neighbors anyway. Yes. Uh, also, in terms of ECOWAS and, and so on. I guess uh, you can draft a declaration of Cape Town. Yes. That will give a kind of roadmap. Yes. Where do you want to go from now, from today? Because as you know, the um, head of state of government in the summit last February, uh, 17, 18, uh, in Addis Abeba, uh, made the year 2023 uh, as the year for implementation of AFCFT. That would lead to road paper, TOR, project, whatever, but a kind of like white, white paper that really will lay down and will speak to the head of state, to the, the very deciding people, the head of state and government, the minister of trade in, in the industry. So I guess this is one point. A second point, I mean, uh, this was mentioned this morning in the session, is about the free movement of goods, but also of persons. We have trouble in having visa. And one of the suggestions also that uh, I will make to you and to the whole, actually, Secretariat of uh, AFCFTA is to have what I call an AFCFTA visa. Visa, yes. yes, yes. That will start first and foremost with the private sector. Yes. No member of the private sector should be, should, should be impeded yes. from attending like this kind of meeting and more importantly from moving his or her goods mm -hmm. to another country. Very good. So I know that we have security uh, issues. Yes. We know that. Uh, we know that uh, now we are in very troubling moments uh, in terms of terrorism and so and so on. But in terms of really moving trade and facilitating, because this session was also about, yes. and this morning was about facilitation, facilitating the free movement mm -hmm. of persons, <coughs> the goods we can do. Yes, yes. And they are doing it, like you know, even yes. non uh, accounted for. Yeah. Uh, but the person are really the ones that should uh, get this thing, and we need to. Make sure that, uh, and uh, last question also, uh, last element also, and I will also talk to uh, my brother Yusuf uh, on the payment system. Africa Exim Bank, once again, the twin brother of AFCFTA, is doing very much. I come from a country like Senegal. We share with uh, eight francophone countries uh, the CFA, currency CFA, uh, which is pegged to the uh, former French franc and now to the euro, but through France. And that uh, French currency, that currency, francophone currency, is also shared by eight other members in Central Africa. With the FAPS, the issue is such. <coughs> and we speak on this issue from a very like, ideological way, or theoretical way, or colonial way, or historical way. I mean, you have solved the issue by just allowing these PAPs and making sure that if I sell the goods 
to a non-convertible uh, country money, I mean, I will get my share. And this is about, this is what money is about. So I guess that also, this is something that we should pursue, especially from the private sector, because when you want to buy in multiple markets, but more important, when you buy, you want to get your money. These guys are making sure that you get the money in whatever currency you, you are willing to, to have. So, so, so next in my um, list will be is Kebur, our friend, Kebur Gena, uh, the, uh, from the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce. Thank you and good afternoon and thank you, uh, Dr. Asu. She um, literally grabbed me actually from my seat and uh, <laughs> brought me here. But uh, it must be for a good cause. Uh, the organization that I represent, which um, was also mentioned by Dr. Asu, is also a member of the ABC um, and it's called the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It was established um, uh, in 2009, but started its operation in 2014. So we uh, are almost our 10 years uh, of existence. Um, just briefly about the organization, it has a general assembly. It's, um, it has an executive council, which is, rep you know, which is composed of um, uh, two members from each subregion. So we have five subregions. Actually, we're using the AU subregional sort of category or division. So uh, just to give you an indication, um, East Africa, it's Ethiopia and Djibouti. For um, the next election will take place in about a month or two. Uh, for South Africa, we have Zimbabwe and um, Seychelles. For Central Africa, we have the two Congos. In West Africa, we have Nigeria and uh, Ghana. and North Africa, we have Morocco and Algeria as members of the Executive Council. Uh, the um, organization is not really a, an organization that deals only with issues of chambers. Uh, it's not really a federation of chambers, but it is really a platform which uh, sort of invites and um, uh, takes as members association that are basically supporting businesses in the continent. Um, so it's not really a chamber organization, although the name suggests actually only chambers are members of this organization. In fact, direct businesses can also be members of the organization. In terms of um, activities, five areas of focus. One is to promote the um, uh, AFCFTA, actually across our members and across the continent, and we work with partners actually on this issue. My uh, dear friend Zaya is here for, with ATPC and with the uh, uh, IATF actually. We, we, uh, we work in promoting the IATF across the continent. We also work with uh, UNECA, my dear friend Atumalaku is here also in um, promoting again the IATF. The second area of focus is to help companies actually improve their capacity uh, to produce. Basically, this is a new market. Many of the companies were operating within their national borders. So now the market expands uh, and, and there is uh, a lot that needs to be done at national levels actually to increase the capacities of firms to do business across the continent. The third area is to how, how to green actually companies because many of the African companies are young companies so they have to really incorporate at this stage the greening part of the, uh, the you know of their operation. The uh, fourth is uh, how to help um, women business owners actually in, in the continent across the continent. In fact one of the a major decision that the organization has done is from zero member of the executive council, it's been decided that um, the membership will be 50-50, um, 50 male and 50 female, and this uh, starting actually this year. So uh, that was a decision actually that was taken in Botswana. <laughs> <laughs> that was a decision uh, taken in Botswana last year. 
um, in our uh, principal sort of uh, or flagship uh, conference. In terms of uh, major, major activities, uh, we call it the Africa Connect. We realized actually today that chambers of commerce are not really up to the task of really um, meeting the requirements uh, of the AFCFTA. I think many chambers are still old, um, old type chambers. They're not really responding actually to the requirement of business. They're not quick enough. They're not really flexible enough. And in many instances, actually, we realize that many of these organizations have uh, seen their membership decline. So we want really to rejuvenate actually the chambers. In fact, one of the um, partners that we have on this, in this area is the Dubai Chamber and also the International Chamber by launching what we call the, um, um, the Chamber 4.0. This is basically a chamber that is nifty, technologically capable, and um, um, meeting actually the needs of, uh, of businesses. So that program has started. Actually, all the 54 countries will be participating in it. It's a long-term project. Um, so uh, I think we are very much excited that this will give actually the AFCFTA another, another uh, impetus to, um, uh, to make it happen. Um, very rapidly. We um, also have, just uh, to give you a uh, snapshot of what we do, we produce what we call a snapshot, in fact, of all the 54 countries for possible investors to have um, information of each country in terms of uh, the economic indicators, the political situations, the basic, actually, uh, infrastructure that a country has available. All, all these data are taken from secondary, sort of, uh, secondary data from various publications, um, but put together into um, one uh, booklet. Actually, it's also online. This year, we're producing, actually, what every country's, um, um, what are the major, you know, top, uh, 20 exporters and importers in various, <coughs> in various oh, sectors sorry. actually for possible match up. We launched actually the, uh, um, the first uh, uh, business match up between countries uh, and companies actually. So uh, we had actually Ethiopia with uh, Accra, with Ghana, where we have actually business people from both sides talking to each other and see whether that would be somewhat translated into physical or in-person meeting and investment perhaps, actually. So we work also on the corridor. The first corridor we, we worked is the Addis uh, Djibouti Corridor. It's supported by the AFTB. And here we tried actually to sort of help cross-border businesses actually um, start thinking about the um, benefit of the AFCFTA and how they should really position themselves to go beyond actually the, the corridor, but also um, to look the um, continent as a possible business market. So these are basically the organization in terms of overall actually view that the organization has, and this is what the uh, executive um, uh, council um, said in its uh, last report. We uh, feel that the um, that the progress made uh, by the Secretariat of the AFCFTA to date is very impressive, but we um, also say that's not enough, actually. Uh, I think the momentum is being lost because um, uh, the, the, um, the uh, business people on the ground are not yet seeing the result that they all expected. So that is something that we would like actually to sort of voice. The, um, the, other, the other issue that um, also um, came up actually, which I want to share with you, and which was raised uh, by yourself, and that is about the movement of people. I think that's also progress seemed to be um, st stalling there. 
uh, there was two or three, just before COVID actually, countries were in fact um, moving ahead in uh, facilitating the, uh, the movement of people actually issuing uh, online visas and um, you know, visas at the airport, but this seems to be stalling now and we want really to revive that part of it. Uh, the, um, the other thing that we also feel that countries are not really doing is, aside actually the FCFTA, still uh, transaction at borders and the travel between one country to another is still very, very difficult. And even if you have the AFC FTA, if these issues are not really addressed, then we're not really going that far. And so these are the issues actually uh, the organization is bringing to, to the fore. Uh, I think I'll stop there, my five okay. minutes. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Tabu, uh, I guess, I guess um, those issues once again echo very much uh, what your colleague was saying uh, in terms of regional and in terms of uh, continental. Uh, I will also touch on the issue of governance. There is clearly an issue of governance of the uh, uh, credit institution. I mean, those neighbors don't talk to each other. And they are in neighboring countries, uh, apart from this coming from uh, ECOWAS, uh, this power. And so, now the, the issue of governance needs to be solved internally and externally. Mm -hmm. And uh, one element in your declaration or in, or in whatever agenda item that you may be having, uh, will be really to, to make sure that uh, uh, you solve this issue. The visa, the visa question, we, we, we mentioned it, and also the issue of the information. Once again, we have a long-standing partner in ITC, uh, International Trade Center, uh, that is providing uh, those services to us as countries and also to our umbrella organization or even to our RECs. And uh, we may, maybe we need uh, Mrs. Uh, Summer to refresh the MOUs or whatever, I guess you have an MOUs with the FCA anyway, but in terms of practical uh, for the organization, maybe uh, you will need, and they will need, of course. Uh, and uh, like uh, the uh, general manager of uh, Dubai Transit Center was saying, uh, maybe the, the, the guy will be solving your problem is next, next to you. So you are next to them, they are next to you, so please network and then uh, amplify whatever Don Bosco was saying about the very role of ITC, because I know firsthand, because I was delegate uh, to WTO, and I was covering ITC, so, and I'm still having uh, the ITC. And the last element, I guess, you mentioned about the, uh, the momentum, that you lost the momentum, uh, but now, this and the implementation, the momentum is to be renewed. That to be renewed, and we have uh, uh, the possibility to renew it, and please make sure that uh, we avail ourselves of this forum and of this opportunity to make sure that uh, we get the right. Now we're moving to the next, uh, I would say, segment of the session, the governance part. Uh, and uh, with that, I will give the floor to Mrs. Tumi uh, Dlamani from uh, APRM. Uh, Yusuf Daya prepared himself. And the uh, last one on this uh, um, governance will be uh, Dr. Yao. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Falu. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dumi Lamini, and I represent the African Peer Review Mechanism, which is an organ of the African Union. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the CFTA Secretariat for extending an invitation to us to participate um, in this very important panel. Well, um, Dr. Fali has asked me to speak around the issue of governance, and this is a very important one when it comes to effective implementation of the CFTA. And I was hoping that one of the panelists representing business organizations will actually speak about the role of the Chambers of Commerce. So I will touch on that based on the work that we've done at the APRM with regards to promoting good governance on the continent. So the APRM as an institution and an organ of the AU has its mandate to promote good governance 
um, and recover good governance across the, the, the board, including political, democratic governance, economic governance, and corporate governance. And specifically with regards to corporate governance, because this is the area that touches on governance within the private sector, we have found that there are major challenges on the continent. And this is partly because, of course, the dominant sector in, in, on, on our continent, the dominant business sector is, in fact, the SMMEs and the informal sector. So our view is that for the CFTA to be implemented effectively, we will need businesses that are competitive. We will need businesses that are strong. We will need businesses that have the right sort of governance policies that ensure that businesses can operate um, legally, that can ensure that uh, businesses have the right sort of um, objectives, have the right sort of transparency, disclosure, and all of those very important elements of good governance. So we see the role of the Chambers of Commerce, which is part of the traditional roles of the Chambers of Commerce being to capacitate particularly SMMEs and the informal sector, and there has to be a strong bias, and I'm glad that most people on this panel have said so as well, a strong bias towards women-owned and youth-owned businesses. So that's the first thing that we believe that as part of the traditional role of, of chambers of commerce, this needs to be strengthened. And of course we understand that you know, the willingness is very high, capacity is high, but resources are finite. And so that's where we believe that it's going to be critical for chambers of commerce across the countries to begin to work together, to strengthen that cooperation. Because on the one hand, while we're talking about improving corporate governance of the businesses, there's also, as you have said, the need to standardize and harmonize the manner in which you improve the competitiveness of these businesses. And in order for that to be effective, there has to be exchange of information amongst the chambers. There has to be exchange of best practices and benchmarking. And primarily, once that has happened, there has to be follow-ups in terms of making sure that you are tracking the manner in which the impact and whether the, what you intended to be done is in fact happening. The second part, which we believe is going to be critical for the role of the chambers to assume will be with regards to the monitoring and the tracking of the implementation of this tool. Now, at APRM, our man, the manner in which we implement our mandate is that we do what is called reviews, country reviews. So we go into our member states and we assess them for adherence to some of the international standards and but more importantly to the AU set standards and rules. And we, we assess them, we then make contributions and recommendations to the member states in terms of how um, those member states have in fact adhered to particular policies, and to the extent that they haven't, we make recommendations. And in the course of the work, we've also had the pleasure to deal very extensively with chambers of commerce. And I believe that the CFTA being the game changer that we're speaking about, there's going to be a need as well for chambers of commerce to begin to reprioritize their own focus into how effectively this CFTA is being implemented at a national level and continentally. Now that's going to have to need more resources for the chambers and, and that's where the need for cooperation with not just the chambers themselves but with governments with developing partners is going to be key. Because unless we have the capacity and the capability to track implementation, and secondly, to ensure that we address any emerging issues that may not have been anticipated, then I think it's going to be very difficult for the business sector to progress at the rate that we are hoping for 
that we have been hoping for and speaking about in the past two days. So at APRM, we stand very ready as um, we work with policymakers to support the business support organizations, to work with yourselves with regards to ensuring that the implementation of this policy is taking place very transparently and effectively. We also stand ready to support the business um, organizations to ensure that we come up with the necessary tools which are not foreign because this is the work that we've been doing as APRM to ensure that we have the right sort of trade policy review mechanisms. And we can borrow from what the APRM is doing. We can also borrow from what the WTO has been working on, but ensuring at all times that we adhere and, and we respect the shared values of the African Union and that at all times we ensure that we stay true to what the CFTA seeks to achieve, which is um, Africa integration, socioeconomic development, and inclusiveness. Those are my preliminary remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Just a, a word while um, Yusuf prepare himself. Uh, professor Melaku, my professor, is really uh, doing work on this one, on how to harmonize. Uh, those issues in terms of trade, in terms of governance, and I guess that uh, in the course of uh, this year, maybe uh, something will come up from this. So thank you. Maybe coming from here, speaking from here. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, I'm, I'll be very quick. I, I actually came here more to, to listen to what the chambers had to say because as, as a bank and one of the key partners of the AFCFTA, it's important to get a sense what the, of what the chambers and the private sector need so that we can design the products that we do design to help support implementation of the AFCFTA. Because as we've been saying over the past two days, it's the private sector that's going to trade, it's the private sector that drives the AFCFTA uh, implementation. So, so I'm very happy to see this. You know, I've been working on, on private sector issues for, for several years across the continent. And it's so good to see East African Business Council, Comesa Business Council, SADC Business Council, the Pan-African Chamber, the African Business Council, the OACHI, these institutions coming together uh, to, to drive a common agenda, because that is what we need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the bank, in, in fact, uh, as a key partner of the AFCFTA implementation, has developed a number of initiatives to support the private sector, and, and we work very closely with a, with a number of the partners in the room today. So I'm actually here to, unfortunately, do a bit of a sales pitch, uh, rather than provide policy. So I, it's very interesting. We keep engaging with them to learn what we need to do in the products we need to develop. And over the course of the years of our engagement, some of those products have now become flagship initiatives, not only of Epixon Bank, but of the entire continent. The first one Mr. Kabul talked about is the inter-African trade gap. Uh, what we found is that simply because of lack of information about what our neighbors are producing, what is available across the continent, we don't trade with each other. So for instance, if I give you an example, in West Africa, they import in excess of $2 billion per annum from outside of Africa. Yet there is sufficient supply within the continent to meet that demand. Southern Africa, we import over $600 million worth of leather annually. Yet, Ethiopia, Djibouti, West Africa can supply a large portion of that. So we felt it important to break this information asymmetry through the establishment of the Intra-African Trade Fair. Uh, so here's my first sales pitch. I'll get to the second one in a bit. The first sales pitch is we invite the Chambers of Commerce, we invite everyone present here participate in the third edition of the Inter-African Trade Fair, which will take place in Cairo, Egypt in November of this year. The first two events delivered over $72 billion, uh, uh, $72 billion in deals, and we're looking at, at stronger participation this year, and we invite everyone to participate. We invite the Chambers of Commerce to reach out to their members to make sure they are represented. The second one, and something that was discussed here, is to build comfort around counterparty uh, if, if a business in, in East Africa wants to trade with a business in West Africa, you know, one of the issues that we always find is concern around 
how do I know that I'm dealing with a verified partner on the other side? How do I ensure that the person I'm speaking to, I'm engaging with, uh, is, is, is real, is, is a business I can trust, meets the governance requirements that Dumi talked about as well? The bank has developed what it calls the Mansa platform, which is, called an, uh, which is an African customer due diligence platform. It's a central repository for customer due diligence information. We work very closely with the African uh, central banks. In fact, the platform has been endorsed by the Association of African Central Bank Governors as the preferred due diligence platform for Africa. The idea behind this is that you will only have verified um, companies on that platform companies that are verified through their financial system. So KYC uh, and CDD requirements are all complied with, so you know you're dealing with a verified partner on the other end. We encourage the chambers of commerce, we encourage the businesses here to look at the platform, register on the platform and make use of it. Uh, because what it does is it ultimately it reduces the cost of access to finance. Uh, if you have a central platform, every time a, a client goes to a bank, cost of having to do that due diligence doesn't exist. We have a central platform where that information can be extracted from. That's just pitch number two. Uh, pitch number three, and it's not a pitch, this one is not a pitch actually. Uh, the, the moderator spoke about, about PAPS, uh, the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System. So I just want to give you a brief overview of what it is for those who may not know uh, what, what PAPS is. One of the key constraints to intra-African trade for, for, for many years now is the issue of currency inconvertibility. The issue of us having to rely on external partners to settle trade transactions between neighboring countries. Why should a payment that I'm making to my neighboring country have to be channeled through the US or Europe before I can transact with, with my neighbor? It costs Africa an estimated $5 billion annually. So the bank has put in place the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System, which is a platform that allows for the payment and settlement in, for intra-African trade transactions using local currency. So a exporter in Nigeria to Ghana, the Ghanaian importer can pay in CD, the Nigerian exporter will receive Naira. And this happens through our test in our pilot in West Africa, this happens in seven seconds at a fraction of the cost. So it happens in seven seconds at a fraction of the cost. Uh, so we estimate a $5 billion saving. We've been piloting it in West Africa. We currently have nine central banks, almost 10 central banks that have signed up to the platform, over 60 switches that have signed up to the platform, and it is one of the operational instruments under the AFCFTA. And again, it's a direct response to the need of the private sector. Right, the final pitch, and a very quick one, this one. The bank has also put in place what it calls the Pan-African Private Sector Trade and Investment Committee. Uh, Dr. Asfour is one of our, our vice chairs of that committee. The committee is effectively trying to create a private sector think tank that will support all these organizations sitting on the floor here today, that will drive resource mobilization, that will drive research for private sector policy, trade and investment issues. So the pitch, we have our third annual survey launched this year. It's a sentiment survey for African businesses. Uh, we're doing it in collaboration with the African Business Council, Kawachi, uh, PACI, ITC, UNECA, AUDA, NAPED, and the AFCFTA Secretariat. Which is, please respond to the survey. I will have it circulated through the AFCFTA Secretariat. Please circulate it to your members. Uh, what we found is, is some very interesting results in the, in the previous surveys, which pointed to some of the emerging concerns across the continent. As, as the concerns around COVID disappeared, the increasing concerns around global macroeconomic issues, the increasing concerns around security issues as, as an issue that the private sector feels strongly. And these are important because these are the things we can take to our policy makers and help support our private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, um, from uh, Africa Asian Bank the twin brother of AFCFTA. Now we're giving the floor to um, Dr. Yao Guevara uh, from the um, US Chamber of Commerce and International Affairs and is um, also in capacity of uh, Executive Director of US Africa Business Center. So we'll be speaking uh, from a partnership uh, angle and from how 
I mean, the whole success that uh, they have been having in region and also in some uh, trading element can be shared, uh, can be benchmarked with uh, with Africa. And feel free to also uh, come in in whatever relevant issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to make three quick points. I'm not sure how many time we have left. Uh, but, uh, That's okay, go ahead. Yeah, but I, 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 I'll tell you I'm extremely excited to be here, uh, to be part of this uh, initiative, um, and, and I will tell you why. And I also share with you what we have been doing so far with the uh, AFCFG Secretariat. Uh, and, and also reflect a little bit on what can be done from the chambers, the African chambers perspective. Uh, as he said, we, uh, I'm from the U.S. Africa Business Center. Uh, it's part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, the largest trade organization in the world. Uh, we have more than three million members um, in, in across uh, 100 countries. Uh, in Africa, we are present uh, in more than 20 uh, markets, uh, actually more markets. Uh, and we are excited because this uh, is an initiative that will be uh, very useful, very important for, for, for all our members. Uh, you can imagine moving from very small markets, fragmented market, to a big market of 1.3 billion. I think there is no other uh, you know, expectation from a private sector to see that happen. Uh, but we also believe strongly uh, before this happened, before this opportunity are laid out, uh, and for the private sector to play the role, uh, it's important to uh, making sure the rules and the regulations are right. The environment is right, so people are attracted to coming uh, and investing uh, in Africa. Uh, the, the U.S. Chamber and U.S. private sector usually very quiet, but are all over here in Africa. Uh, some of them have been here for 50, 60, 70, even 100 years, more than 100 years. Uh, company like GE, uh, you know, we have a company like Procter & Gamble, I see some in, in the room. Uh, John Deere, Caterpillar, uh, all those companies that you, you all know, uh, are here creating millions and millions of jobs uh, for Africans. Uh, and we felt it's important for us to be part of this process. Uh, we fully understand this is a process by Africans. Uh, for Africans, uh, but as a main player here on the ground, we felt it's imp also important for us to contribute into this process. Uh, so uh, what we have done uh, is to really uh, discuss with the Secretariat, and uh, as a matter of fact, on the margin of the U.S. Africa Business Forum that happened last year in Washington, where we had more than 40 head of state from Africa coming, uh, we signed an MOU uh, to formalize our contribution to the implementation of the EFCFG. Uh, and we put quickly together a tax force, uh, a working group, a joint working group with the Secretariat uh, to really identify, first of all, what are the key objectives? What is it that they're trying to achieve? Uh, what are the, the needs that uh, they feel uh, you know, need to be put on the table? But more importantly, you know, what is the expectation? What will they need from us? Because we feel this is uh, not a supply approach, but it's a more a demand-driven approach. They need to tell us what they want, and we try to bring our support. So that is the lens at which we have uh, started our engagement. And, and I will tell you, uh, from December to now, uh, through our uh, working group, we have in the working group, four subgroups, a group on digital economy, a group on value chain development, uh, a group on supply chain and, and, and custom modernization uh, that we put together, and we were able to cluster all our companies that are working in those different sectors. And then to ask them, what do you feel, uh, what, what uh, based on the recommendation and uh, the needs and the objective that the Secretary has fixed, uh, discuss with our company to see how they could share uh, best practices. So on the digital front, we have actually worked on the white paper uh, together with our uh, 
technical partner, the, the E-Trade Alliance, uh, that is actually here in the room, uh, to, to write a white paper on uh, best practices. You know, we're talking about digital protocol, but this is not the first time it's happening in the world. It has happened in many, many places, uh, in Latin America, in Asia. So what should a good uh, you know, digital protocol look like? Uh, so those type of things that we feel uh, instead of reinventing the rule, we can share because we have, as I said, companies that are already here, part of the ecosystem. Uh, I also want to tell you we also have members of the chamber that are African, African companies. Uh, so we, we, that's, that's really what we do. And we feel uh, this is really, that's my third point, uh, a, a very opportune uh, time for the chamber, look at chambers, to organize themselves, to work together, uh, and, and to be able to advocate for uh, good rules, uh, but also to making sure uh, they are able to do a good mapping. Uh, as we're talking, uh, we have close to 90 million SMEs on the continent, 90 million, half of which are in Nigeria. Uh, and this is only one component. You have uh, the informal sector, those that are actually not even known, that are doing a lot of uh, good. What framework is put in place to allow these actors uh, to be playing the, the, the right role into the, the whole process? So it's a lot, a lot of things that should be done, and uh, we are more than committed, as I explained to you, uh, why it's important for us to be part of this system, uh, this process, uh, to supporting uh, the chambers uh, and to making sure uh, we are able to share best practices. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, this, those are a few points I would like to make. Uh, if there's a question, I'm, I can go into more detail on, on what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Dr. Yao, for this very insightful uh, view. Uh, I'll have, uh, and then you'll uh, have the opportunity to respond later on, uh, about the role of the diaspora. Uh, I guess uh, we are talking about AFCFTA and we have diaspora. Uh, I think that uh, the link uh, could be done and have to be done, I guess. Uh, also, in terms of uh, success story, I know that you have been very... So, do you want uh, me to talk about quickly yeah, the diaspora? Yeah, you cover it now, and then uh, we'll get the floor, yeah. uh, to the floor, and then... Uh, I think the diaspora is extremely important. I'm actually an example of the diaspora. I'm, you know, from the U.S., I'm in the U.S., but I'm also from Africa. And because we are, we have... Uh, a unique position of knowing both Africa and where, wherever we are in the world, we are a unique place to be the advocate, be the voice, attracting, you were talking about attracting business here in, the, in Africa, but I think the, the diaspora has a big role to play into in that. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, government need to put processes in place that allow diaspora to be able to come and, and contribute. Uh, they are not looking for uh, necessarily for, for jobs here, but they want to have the, uh, an environment that allows them to come and even create jobs, more yeah. jobs. Uh, so th it's very, very much uh, important to, uh, to lean on the diaspora. Uh, from the last account, I think there are more than 125 million diaspora uh, across the world, uh, and this is even an understatement. I think there are more uh, African origin that are uh, outside uh, the continent. And they have a big role to play, and, and I believe uh, uh, the AFCFTA, uh, we understand, is making a provision to be working with the diaspora. Uh, I also know that uh, AFRECSIM is also working on something, something like that. The African Union has also decided to making sure uh, diaspora is seen as the sixth region of Africa. So those are good, but I think we need to put uh, concrete measures in place to allow in the diaspora to come and play uh, that role. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for this. And then maybe uh, it's not for you to respond because this is a more uh, broad uh, policy issue is the um, AGOA element vis-a-vis -vis the FCFTA. Uh, we need to find a new uh, term on this, uh, but maybe within your center or within the chamber, uh, something also will be done in order to, to really iron out and harmonize the, uh, the two issues. Yeah. Very quickly uh, on this, and then sure. we... Sure. Uh, I, I want to tell you, first of all, that the U.S. Uh, government is very much uh, excited about the AFCFTA. They are supporting, I think they also have an MOU that has been signed, uh, together with ours uh, from the private sector. And, and AGOA is a very important tool. Uh, it's a tool that has been there since 2000. Uh, but unfortunately, very few countries have 
taking advantage of, of our goal. Uh, it's going to expire in 2025. Uh, there are currently discussions to see what is going to be the next iteration of our goal, uh, but also seeing the link between our goal and the AFCFTA. Uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the AFCFTA and how these two tools will communicate and be uh, useful uh, for uh, development on the continent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, now I will ha get the opportunity to uh, Mrs. Lily Sommer from ITC before getting some uh, questions from the floor. We have 15 minutes left. Uh, Mrs. Sommer, you have the floor to uh, present uh, your report. Yeah, you come here. Thank you and uh, good afternoon uh, everyone and I'd just like to thank the organizers for extending uh, the invitation to ITC to participate in this critical session. Um, ITC is a joint agency of the UN and the World Trade Organization with a very specific mandate to support SMEs to connect to international markets. So this session focused on, on chambers is very critical to us. Um, we have a dedicated program called One Trade Africa to support SMEs, women and youth to benefit from the AFCFTA agreements. And this has three pillars. Um, so the first pillar is focused on sensitization and training for SMEs on the AFCFTA. The second pillar is focused on supporting and strengthening business support organizations to update and tailor their service offerings with the AFCFTA in mind and we're working very closely uh, with some of the chambers on the stage today, uh, the Africa Business Council, uh, and, and also FAWASI in this particular area. And then finally the third, third pillar is related more to working closely with policymakers um, to update their frameworks and regulations to make sure that they work for the business sector. In, in the context of the AFCFTA. And of course, all of the activities and interventions we have on the AFCFTA are delivered in, in partnership with the AFCFTA Secretariat. Um, so we do have an MOU with the Secretariat focused specifically on making the AFCFTA agreement work for the private sector. So we just wanted to take this opportunity today um, to share with you two new products that we have um, with the Secretariat. So the first is a glossary, uh, which my colleague Regina, I believe, will be disseminating around the room today. Um, but this is a new product that we launched uh, in Niamey um, on the sidelines of the AU Industrialization Summit uh, at the end of last year. And it's essentially a, a product to unpack the AFCFTA agreement for small businesses. Um, so that they can better understand the complex legal, uh, commercial, and customs terms of the agreement. Um, so this first edition comprises of about 100 uh, terms, and it's accompanied with very easy to digest uh, definitions, practical examples, and reference lists so firms know exactly where uh, in the agreement uh, to locate the terms that um, are important to them. And I think for us, really, the, the main benefit of the glossary is that it has been crafted with inputs and guidance from the African private sector, including uh, SMEs, uh, women and, and youth entrepreneurs, and also uh, business support institutions and the chambers here with us today. Currently, uh, the glossary is available in English, um, but will soon be translated into French, Arabic, uh, Portuguese, and uh, Swahili. And today we're also launching an accompanying uh, mobile application um, that's now available in the Google App Store and the Apple App Store. So it's a more pocket uh, friendly um, version of the, uh, the glossary. So we'd encourage you to uh, download that. You can simply search in your App Store uh, for the AFCFTA uh, glossary. And then the second uh, product we wanted to share with you is uh, these business profiles. So ahead of the AFCFTA Business Forum, ITC partnered uh, with the UN Economic Commission for Africa, uh, which is also here with us today, 
um, the Organization for Women in International Trade, um, and OYEG, uh, the African Women Empowerment Group, um, and of course the AFCFTA Secretariat, to organize a three-day uh, deep dive masterclass uh, for SMEs on the AFCFTA. And a critical component of this was training the SMEs on how to uh, pitch to investors um, the products that they're selling um, and the opportunities that they want to reach um, in the, the African continent. So we developed these business profiles, um, which essentially the profiles for all the SMEs who attended the training, 55 SMEs from 17 uh, African countries um, in various sectors. And to share these profiles with you, um, with investors that may be in, in the room, um, the idea that these businesses are ready uh, to do business under the AFCFTA. Um, they were also accompanied with badges with the barcodes so that they can um, engage in matchmaking operations at the, the business forum. So these two documents um, are being circulated and I've also been informed that uh, UNECA have their AFCFTA FAQ uh, document which is a very rich resource on the AFCFTA and will also be uh, circulated. So let me stop here. Uh, thank you and to working with the chambers on the AFCFTA. I'll be reminded that uh, we are over time uh, and we need to conclude. Uh, maybe I will have opportunity for the room to uh, engage uh, and uh, with our panelists and then we'll ask Dr. Amani to conclude uh, our session. Okay, maybe, yes, uh, the lady first and then you. Uh, is there a mic circulating in the room? Okay. You introduce yourself, your affiliation, and then your question. The lady first, please. And then you and him. Three. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. I thought my brother Four. would okay. uh, thank you. me and give me the opportunity. Thank you so much and our great panelists here. I'm Dr. Janine Wimana Nicole, and I'm from Rwanda, but I, I'm here representing Africa Private Sector Summit, which is a think tank uh, that is based in, in Accra, and we focus more on policy and uh, implementation of evidence-based um, program under FTCA. So, um, one of my, I'll say one of the questions that I wanted to ask to the eminent panelists here, Dr. Safu and uh, the entire team here, and our colleague from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, how do we create a seamless platform for the, for, for the African continent, for the private sector? that is relevant, contextual, and Africanized. I understand we do have the RECs, and, and then as well we do have the Africa Business Council, and we have as well the APRM that look at uh, policy reviews and so forth, and uh, PASI and others. So the question that I'm asking is, is it possible for East African Community Business Council the framework they've got, they've got of doing business under the same FTCA, speak to the Southern or the, the ECOWAS and so forth. We know that is not possible. The reality is it doesn't work, although we, our, our head of state have agreed on this framework, but it doesn't talk to each other in a sense. The, same, the second question is, yeah. is it possible for the private sector under this platform with Dr. Asafu here to have an infrastructure that will be seamless, the continent here is, is it's not, I mean, 54 state is not like uh, one, one, one size will fit all, but we know there is a diversity. In the same place that we are here, how many of the French-speaking countries are here? How many of the Luxophone are here? But I've got, uh, let me express this. They've got, I've got some of the colleagues here from the French-speaking countries who were struggling to follow this discussion. 
but sitting at this level. How do we make sure intentionally that we are working in a way that is well integrated? What is the enabling environment that we've got as a legal framework for the private sector, such as the-, the Thank you, the thank, you. Right? Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Please give to, you to the gentleman, and then W. Uh, good thank afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is Tyson Spanda from Business Unity South Africa. So we are a, a confederation of uh, the entire private sector in South Africa. So we actually represent about 95% of um, private corporations. So uh, my question, the first one, I think she alluded to. So um, we know that uh, the, our regional business forums, such as your uh, CEDEC business forum, they are actually dysfunctional. So uh, through the experience of our Eastern uh, counterparts, what can we do under AFC FTA to ensure that there will be integration and harmonization of systems between the southeast and the central part and uh, part of the region. Thank you. So that it enables trade. The last part is uh, in terms of um, the AFC FTA implementation. Uh, in practice, it looks good. Uh, sorry, in our presentation, it looks good, but in practice, it is a bit uh, uh, complicated. So, what can be done uh, by heads of state or uh, AFC FTA secretariat to ensure that the governments that are actually offending or are the offenders of the AFC FTA agreement? can be actually um, uh, not punished, but dealt with uh, accordingly. Thank, thank you. And also uh, fa you. fast track thank that you. Give the uh, settlement. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, we are running out of time. Please. Greetings, everyone. Please. Take the mic very closely. Thank you. Better? Yeah, you are good. Greetings, everyone. I greet you all in the name of the most high. Jeremiah Musilasi. OK. Uh, I'm quite delighted, honorable moderator, to be here today, uh, having traveled more than 2,000 kilometers to come from the east of this country to be here. So I would just ask for a little bit of patience mm -hmm. uh, from your side. They don't have patience with me, so yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I give you one minute, please. Yeah. please so please. What, what I would like to bring forth is that in as much as we are looking at the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, what is important is for us to still reach to the minds and hearts of the African population. And without having the hearts and minds of the African population, the downtrodden, the ones that are down there uh, doing businesses, not having registered, being informal, without considering them, we would not be able to make any traction in what we do. During the COVID-19, one of the things that transpired is that registered businesses were able to make uh, an application in order to move around, but people were not. So when the advert or the video that we saw yesterday about AFTA, and you also, Mr. Moderator, emphasize that that business people should be in a position to move freely, but leaving the people behind would be actually paid business. So when we look at the movement of, of businesses, equally it should also be for the movement of the ordinary person. Now, just a story when I say 100 20, miles. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 2017, <laughs> we had an all Africa Rastafari gathering mm. in Ethiopia. 2018, it went again to Ethiopia, having both members from the continent and the living spora, not the diaspora, from the living spora. 2019, we had it again in South Africa. Mm -hmm. 2022, 21, we were compelled to go online uh, due to the disruption of COVID. The 2022, last year, we had it again in Ghana. It was not driven with any support of a financial institution, of any support of a big corporate but to the hearts and minds of those that have the conviction of inter-Africa trade at heart. Thank you. So Thank you. that is the appeal, that Thank you. we would not be able to move forward without reaching Thank the you very much. minds of the people. I give thanks. OK. The other gentleman, and then you will be the last. Yeah, please. Yeah. Stay, stay close to him, and then. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Good afternoon. I'm Bihari, the president of the business chamber of Tolas and Industry in Mauritius. Okay. The, the dot is between the industry and the, I don't know whether you are aware. Mauritius is just after Madagascar, a, a little dot which is missing in the plan. But nevertheless, let me tell you that we are 100% African. And we are here just to meet other chambers of commerce to create networking with our members because we want to be part of this AFCFTA. And my question to all the panelists here, how can you help us to create this networking so that this mission is a successful one? I, I, Thank I, you. I Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'll just follow that very Please. quickly. I'm Wilmot Allen, based in Nairobi, uh, from the US. And this is not going to be very long. It's just an appeal. I love to work with you all on engaging US chambers, particularly diaspora, uh, which I'd like to integrate more into the conversation here at AFTA uh, to be of assistance to support inter-Africa trade. A good example, we export through a South African company. We helped them to export to the US. They sourced the derivative product, which is Moringa, both here in South Africa and Zambia. They're promoting inter-Africa trade. $2 trillion um, market in terms of uh, nominal buying power among U.S. diaspora alone. So you speak about Moringa? Yes. Moringa, okay. Yes, Moringa. So I'd like to be in touch with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I will uh, give uh, to all the panelists the floor to either respond or make the final comment. Mm -hmm. um, please, I'm sorry, uh, you have seen, uh, you have been pressed. Um, one minute each, yes. and then uh, uh, we, I will give the honor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Amani to conclude. Please. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Okay. Yes, sir. Please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And uh, again, wa I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists uh, in terms of submission. Uh, I, I agree with you, moderator, that we need to to have Cape Town declaration on the private sector engagement on the CFTA. And I think uh, it is uh, fitting uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the chair of African Business Council need to take uh, a leading role to bring all the, the chambers together so that uh, we work together in terms of coordination, uh, in terms of collaboration, in terms of addressing uh, uh, information asymmetry, meaning that we need to have a harmonized and a coordinated information. Uh, two is again to mobilize uh, and coordinate donor resources in terms of supporting the private sector. We have scattered support. So I think we need to have uh, again um, through the African Business Council, of course working with the Regional Business Council, to have a framework for donor coordination in terms of resources to support the private sector, including SMEs, youth, and women in business. Thank you, thank you. Finally, thank you. Okay. we look forward for APR, APR governance, again, to provide support in terms of governance uh, issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Toto, please. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I think to respond to the lady who has spoken about harmonization, I think it, it is possible to do so. It all depends on how SBSOs come together frequently to align and strategize how we push our governments to do so. For example, Comesa has 21 member states, SADAC 15 or 16. If we come together, we've, we've covered probably half of the uh, of Africa. If EAC, ECOWAS, we come together, we strategize on how we are going to do it. We have done it with SADC Business Council during COVID-19, uh, COVID where we pushed our governments to have a harmonized uh, approach to movement of goods and services ac uh, across Comesa, which was followed. So it is possible. Uh, yeah, we need just to have the mindset that uh, it's possible. If we approach our government with doubts that uh, it's not possible, they will also re respond accordingly. So let's come together. Uh, Africa Business Council, uh, Dr. Asfo, uh, let's frequently meet to see what's happening in, in our business councils and then uh, strategize and focus our resources, as I said, so that we can achieve more through synergies. Thank you. Thank you.
Dr. Yao. Sure. Two quick points uh, I would like to make. First, on the uh, on the point how to really create a seamless process to to, to ensure the chambers are able to work and, and have a strong constitution. I think one is, is really on the governance. You need to have a very strong structure in place with a, a strong governance, uh, you know, uh, structure that allows all the key players, the, the ATREX, to play a role, have a visible role, uh, and are able to identify all the key issues. But most importantly, for you to have a very strong value proposition for your members that will feel they have to really be part of this, uh, this process. Uh, second point I want to make is, uh, uh, you know, uh, personally, I work for ECOWAS. I was based in Abuja for close to eight years working in those processes. I know that it's not an easy process. Even for ECOWAS, it was very difficult. So imagine at the continental level. Uh, it, it will take a lot of resilience, a lot of, uh, you know, obligation for, for all of you uh, to make this a reality. Uh, and uh, you have to really lean on all the resources that you have. Uh, and again, the diaspora, the role of the diaspora is extremely important. Uh, at least from the U.S. side, we have the support from the, the U.S. government uh, that is even actually working on a council for the diaspora and uh, putting resources at the disposal of diaspora that could be uh, really uh, a very good opportunity for them to come and invest over here. Uh, we have close to 30 million SME uh, that are in the U.S. willing to invest in Africa. Uh, I think it's important to make sure all the processes and the regulatory framework are in place uh, for them to come and invest and be a, a strong factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I also have um, two last points. I think um, the first one, when Yusuf spoke, I got very worried when he spoke about the platform that's been created by Atrexum for due diligence. And my worry emanates from the fact that at APRM we understand that there are certain countries whose business sector is constituted at least 60% by the informal sector. So if that due diligence platform and they know your customer platform becomes a reality, therefore I'd like to pose a challenge to the business support organizations to say what can you do together with Atrexum to ensure that you leave no one behind. Secondly, when I walked into this room this afternoon, I sat over there and had a very brief conversation with this gentleman who said to me, I'm here because I'm a Pan-Africanist and I've always followed and believed in the speech in 1963 of the Kwame Nkrumah. And that stopped me in my tracks and it, it's made me realize, particularly the last four questions that came up and, and that speak to perhaps the agitation and the impatience with which we want this to happen. My last word would be, we have to accept that projects of this nature are intergenerational. We must do what we can within our lifetime to move it as much as we can. But we also need to understand that we will need to hand over to the next generation. And when we accept that as a reality, then I think we'll be on the right track and we will not beat ourselves too much about some of the work that we'll not be able to do in our lifetime. We will know that we will hand over the work to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very important. Aminu? Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I think, I think talk, talk, uh, talking about our due diligence, that is uh, a concrete mission of our members of commerce that we are doing to make sure that uh, each company going to each member state, we a provider normal information on that one. But uh, coming to my conclusion, I should say Fewasi and uh, PASI, we play a very key role when it was time to draft the ASCFTA. What we should do and what we are doing is to make sure that uh, we work on implementation, we work on, on uh, a monitoring and evaluation of uh, this uh, policy, make sure that we provide to our members what are the business opportunity in the a, a protocol. Let me stand that. That's what they are doing on the Africa Business Council. I believe that the President Dr. Money will uh, conclude on what a business association are ready to do to make sure that uh, we bring private sector voice in uh, this policy implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. Three things that I would like to um, bring to the attention of the audience. One is the communication part of it, and this was an issue that was raised earlier. And in one of the um, um, items that I raised earlier, the Connect Africa, is really to bring all the chambers uh, closer to one another. Mm. Uh, I think we have today 54 chambers, they, which really some of them don't speak to each other. I think we want to change that. And, and that is really very, very important for the FCFTA. Um, secondly, we realize actually that there are a lot of local resources which need to be tapped actually for the, the FTA. And the tendency is always to look outside. I think the focus should be really to sort of look inside and really exhaust the resources that we can easily use to expand production to help actually companies uh, do business or market their products um, outside. And thirdly, the, um, the uh, issue of solidarity is very important. I think this, we, we tend to sort of look at the positive aspect of the CFTA, and obviously there will be winners and losers, and I, I think we seem to sort of discard that part of it. And if we have a lot of losers and only few winners, it's not going to work. I think this is important actually to sort of push our governments that if we want an Africa that is integrated, an Africa that does business with each other, has to work for all Africa, but not for few African countries. And I think this is a very important message that we need really to sort of advance. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I would like at this stage to really ask the audience yes. to applaud for yourself. Really. Uh, this is a very well attended session, and we are very grateful wholeheartedly to all of you and uh, we'd like to uh, really extend our deep uh, gratitude uh, to this. Uh, I conclude, uh, I, I, I get my takeaway to you, and then uh, Dr. Amin will conclude. For number one, declaration. The roadmap, uh, the TORs, the project, whatever, declaration of the private sector, Cape Town declaration. Number two, uh, technical assistance, capacity building, and communication. Number three is governance issue, including uh, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, in the implementation, and uh, number number four or number five will be um, the setting of champions, champions, products champions, youth champions, women's champions, regions champions, services champion. Each cluster, I mean, travel cluster. I know that uh, uh, the Dr. Amani is, is is working on this, but each cluster in the regional and corner value chain has to have. It's champion. champion in order really to have uh, our friend from Exim Bank to support us and to move ladder, uh, to move uh, really closer in this. So thank you very much. And, uh, Moderator. Thank you very much, my dear brother. <laughs> and my dear brothers and sisters of the panel, I am really very happy and glad that all of us here, this powerhouse of the African private sector is together with all of you because this really shows the unity that unity is our strength in Africa. And I believe all of you know African Union, yes? And all of you, all the eight tracks of the African Union, which is COMESA, uh, SADC, East Africa Community, ECOWAS, ICAS, uh, 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 UMA, CENSAD, East Africa Community. So in this uh, uh, hierarchy, the African Union has established the heads of state, the Africa Business Council, to be the continental African private sector. And within African private sector, we have already all the RACs and the business councils and chambers of commerce and private sector federations and union of industries. So this is actually our mandate as Africa Business Council to come together, all of us, and as my brother Bosco said, our strategic plan to be one strategic plan, but implemented but all the, with all the players on the ground. Because FUASI, with its 15 countries, Francophone, my dear sister, this is, we have here the whole West Africa, the Francophone countries, 
they are the one actually who will implement on this side. Pan-African Chamber of Commerce, East Africa Business Council. Comesa Business Council with its 21 members has of, uh, of, of all the things, Mauritius. Mauritius uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce is a member of Comesa Business Council and is chaired actually by the, 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 from Mauritius, our brother Mardei, who is the vice president of the Africa Business Council. We have four vice presidents. Chair of Commerce Business Council, Chair of East Africa Chamber of Commerce, Chair of West Africa Chamber of Commerce, Chair of Banan African Manufacturing Association. Sadiq Business Council is on our board. Pachi is on our board. So we are leaving women entrepreneurs, youth entrepreneurs, SMEs. We have category, actually, we have now 20 clusters that speaks, as my brother have said, to every single thing we're talking about. Trade, industry, energy, investment, green economy and blue economy, uh, fashion industry, uh, mineral development resources, creative industries, all uh, and many others, energy, I can't remember every. So in each sector of this is shared by a private sector entity in this sector. So the infrastructure is shared by the president of East Africa Chamber of Commerce. The agriculture is shared by the president of the uh, West Africa Chamber of Commerce. Transport and Logistics is third by my brother Mardei, who is the president of Commerce Council, and he is the chair of the National Carrier of Air Mauritius. So you see how we really constructed to have integrity among us, and we have our official think tank, Puff Track, that my brother Yusuf has talked about, which is the Pan-African Trade and Investment Committee, supported by Afri Exim Bank, which do studies for our position papers, do studies for actually our integration and make with us these questionnaires to send it to our members of what is the need for us to implement ACFTA. So the whole issue now is how all of us come together for the implementation of ACFTA, not about creating new structure, but strengthening the existing structures on the ground and how, for instance, Chamber of Commerce of Mauritius, which is member of Comesa, we could cascade all our implementation procedures and awareness because there are a lot of people on the ground who are, don't know even ACFTA. If you go on the cross-border women trader that I personally did questionnaire bit for them about Comesa, I asked them, do you know Comesa? They don't know Comesa. They don't know Simplified Trade Same with ACFTA. Our majority, our ma here, my sister, all of us know what is ACFT, but the people on the ground don't know. So what is our real role as private sector? to really popularize ACFTA on the ground and leave no women behind, that uh, no men no, or women or SMEs or youth, and to construct our programs together and implement it together on our territories. This is our major objective. And thank you, my brother, for suggesting to have this declaration, because as Africa Business Council, with all our members here, we're happy to see our role for the implementation of ACFTA and stressing that our strength is our unity. Any fragmentation private sector will go nowhere. And we want to know that whatever present on the African soil cannot be imported from outside. We want to make sure that we add value to the products within the continent and make sure that we empower our African people and have a daily impact on the African women, men, youth, and all of us. This is the real implementation of ACFTA. Anything that is not realizing our African dream of one single market, our African continental free trade agreement, our Africa 23 development agenda, the Africa we want, a prosperous, peaceful, integrated Africa driven by the citizens of Africa. And we are the citizens of Africa. So together we will do it. And I always say, when you want to go fast, you go alone. But if we want to go far, we go together. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank, you, sir. Thank you very much. And the uh, session ended. Uh, see you at the plenary. Thank you. We need to have a photo, group photo. Yeah, a photo. Yeah. A photo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't, don't forget to, to add eh, a component on visa, business visa, eh, among yeah. the declaration. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, my brother. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I need a. Uh, Mm, thank you. I need I need a photo with the, we need a photo here.